Okay, Brad, do you want me to get started? Sure, go ahead, Marshall. Yep. Okay, so uh, Brad and I have a uh, tag team on moderating this session. We want to thank you all for hanging in there in, in this uh, very productive two days or day and a half. And uh, I, I know that many of us are looking for sort of a synthesis discussion. And so we've invited select members of the week to participate in this roundtable. Uh, Julie DeMuth from National Science Foundation's supported National Center for Atmospheric Research will be a part of the roundtable. Brock On from HAAS Alert, Gina Esco from the NOAA Weather Program Office, Sherman Gilliams Jr. from FEMA, and Rebecca Morris from the National Science Foundation as well. And I believe some of these participants are virtual or some and some are in the room. And so we we just wanted to sort of think about the broader sort of conference in totality. And so I'll seed the discussion with a question and then my colleague Brad will manage the discussion uh, once we get going. But I guess I'll, I'll throw this out and anyone can tackle it. What surprised you most from the workshop? Uh, I'll be happy to start. Um, <clears throat> you know, I think that um, one of the things that I find so fascinating is uh, again, not to harken back to my English degree, but uh, so many of the challenges in communications uh, always come down to um, message, medium, and audience. And I think that the more sophisticated our understanding becomes of the content that we are seeking to communicate, the more complicated um, those, those questions become. Uh, it's one thing if, you know, you're just trying to tell people there's a storm coming. Uh, but the more that we know about the storm, the more that we can communicate and the more that those, you know, the audience that you're communicating to and how you're communicating it and how they're going to receive it and what the implications of that communication means. There's all these sort of follow on, you know, secondary tertiary impacts around it. Um, and the more opportunities and methods we have available to us to communicate uh, the more complex those decisions become, right? So if you're just limited to a radio broadcast for everyone and you have a, uh, a like a single language in that community, uh, in many ways, uh, your job is a lot easier, but the more tools you have available to you, now you can communicate over television and over social media, and you've got multiple ways of delivering that message to different audiences. And you can communicate at different times as you approach this particular hazard. Um, and so I think that uh, this this is only going to become more complex and our tool sets are only going to need to become more robust. And I think that for, especially for the experts in this room and the, and the people who manage emergency communication, um, I think that it's an illusion to think that, you know, there's one message that we need to get it out there and we got to keep it simple. I think it's only going to become uh, more and more sophisticated as we go. Anyone, anyone online or yeah, go, go, go right ahead. Julie, go ahead. Yep. I'll keep this um, pretty quick, but I think actually what surprised me maybe builds really nicely on what you were just saying. I really think it's interesting, and Sherman, your your comments were so powerful in this respect, as we've been talking so much about personalization and hyper-localization, how important that is. But to me, it seems like there's a tension between doing that and everything we're discussing about communicating uncertainty, <laughs> especially at longer lead times, because we can't give that hyper-localized, hyper-personalized information. I think there's more and more tools to be able to do that. I think also more data is at our fingertips to be able to do that. And so I'm not quite as articulate as everything you were just saying, Brock, but I think um, I think this is a future and it is a direction that we're really emphasizing, but how do we do this at the same time that we don't necessarily have the skill to be able to do this at the individual level, um, whether it's spatially precise, temporally precise for a certain kind of hazard for a certain kind of need. And it's not that I think this is a bad thing. Maybe um, I think Gina said this beautifully, a challenge is an opportunity, but this is a challenge. And I think recognizing the potential tension of this challenge with some of the, the, um, some of the issues and the difficulties of being able to do this is really important. I'll just jump in to say, it's interesting. On the one hand, I'm not sure anything shocked me 
but yet I was so eager to learn more, right? And hear more um, from everyone that was in the room and, and virtually online. I think my one message that I'm sort of coming away with, and this, this comes from working on a, a project where we put simple in the title, it was called Hazard Simplification. Uh, we were gonna quote, simplify the National Weather Service Watch Warning Advisory System. And the one thing that I will say, the one takeaway from that is simple isn't easy. And so even though simplicity is desired, what I heard today was a lot of complexity to get to that quote, simple message. And so I don't want us to conflate simplicity with ease or efficiency or easy, right? Because um, I think that achieving that parsimonious, simple message is actually quite challenging. Um, one, trying to understand all of these unique audiences, uh, understanding the forecast and having the agility of that forecast to meet all of those unique needs. I am excited about that. Uh, and again, I guess I'll reiterate my point. I don't think any one of us can do it alone. And so I think what, what doesn't surprise me about today, but excites me about today, is how do we take all of this and move forward? How do we, how do we empower each other to learn from one another and work together moving forward, right? I think actually Jen Henderson, I'm, I'm trying to look at all my notes from the last couple of days. She made points in her talk earlier yesterday. Gosh, I feel like it was two weeks ago now just because there was so much information about are our organizations set up to study this? Are we too siloed? And what can we do to work even more collaboratively together to achieve these shared goals? Thank you, Gina, really powerful. Uh, I don't know, Rebecca or Sherman? Yeah. Um, I'll chime in here. I think like Gina, I'm not sure anything surprised me, but I think um, one thing that really struck me was the diversity of perspectives here, which I knew was gonna happen, but also how everyone's working in the same direction and also the depth in each of those perspectives. It wasn't just you know, one meteorologist and one social scientist working at NOAA and one person from a you know, communication company and one researcher. We really had a huge amount of depth in all of these perspectives. And that really, um, I think really sets up well for the future as, as Gina said, because um, each of these perspectives is so complex and each of these contributions to addressing these issues is so complicated that you need multiple people from each kind of area at the table. And so, um, yeah, I mean, the kind of depth as long with the diversity, I think was really striking. And then even if people didn't agree on the specifics, I think everyone was really working in the same direction as far as communicating information better, helping save lives, helping reduce other impacts, all those kind of, kinds of things. That's good, Brent. Thank you. Trevor? Well, well, I just got here an hour ago, so I don't think I should be <laughs> remarking on what surprised me, but I will say from the little time I was able to observe, um, I hope it resonates is that we can't afford to look at uh, reaction as a way forward. Preparedness is the first response. And the way you deal with hyper-localized decision-making is through having that thought process happen before there's a disaster. What are my options if I live in this area? If, you know, and that way I, I you know, with that, that paradox between safety and certainty, um, people with disabilities, we live in an unsafe world all the time. We're used to it. So it doesn't, it takes a lot to scare somebody who has broken their neck or has to navigate with no sight and all those things. It's the safety part that they value more than the certainty. I mean, the certainty more than the, um, the safety, but but having kind of these conversations before, and it's hard because it's like talking about life insurance. There's no real great time to talk about it, but there is a worse time. And that's when you're on your deathbed, Right. And when you're talking about communication with these communities uh, on the eve of, of a disaster or, or right before landfall, that's the worst time. So how we hold local um, you know, emergency management entities responsible for having these conversations, how do you get people interested? You know, We spent last year trying to get people in Chicago to think about heat in a different way. Yeah, the day at the beach is great, but there are people that are going to die in this heat unless we begin to talk about it in a way that resonates. So having those discussions prior to is probably the only time you're going to be able to contend with what will happen during 
that uh, decision making matrix that they'll run through when a crisis is upon them. Okay, thank you. Uh, taking a little prerogative as moderator, what I'm going to do, Sherman, uh, is, is turn right back around to you. I think we all found this afternoon's session on accessibility pretty compelling and, and interesting. So I'd, I'd like all the panel to, to give some thought and share your thoughts on what is the single most important thing that we can do to make future risk communication more inclusive? And we'll start with you, Sherman. It, it starts with the relationship. Um, I, I went to Tennessee and I was, you know, I was looking at all the re the response and all the different entities, and I didn't see a lot of volunteer organizations, the big veteran community. So I thought, well, you know, you, you should at least call the, you know, the local VSOs and things like that. Um, but they didn't have a relationship. And it turned out that they were invited to the table and the stakeholders simply didn't take them up on the offer. And I don't know if that was because they didn't trust them. Some of it is resources. People don't have time to do anything for free, right? And and you're not going to exactly, you know, you're not going to hire a bunch of people to come in and do all this stuff. But when we see exercises happening and there's no participation, um, we got to be what, what's the barrier there? Do they do they feel like their their input would be valued? Is this process really to prove that everything's great, or are we really looking for gaps? And are we really going to listen to people who are not going to have great things to say, but will learn? Um, and I think with this community as a whole, it, it's hard to it's a hard pill to swallow when people tell you you're inadequate. But if you listen to stakeholders long enough, they'll tell you what's going wrong. And bringing them to the table, it's tough because it requires trust building, uh, especially in areas where there have been failures in the past. Um, but I would say uh, a great amount of investment in trust building and constantly having them uh, invited to the table. Uh, it's got to be nonstop, um, and, and and it may go on forever that way. But uh, but that I think that's where it starts. Sure, let's go down, Julie. Mm -hmm. That means you know you're up next. So, <laughs> um, this is a great question. I think, I think, probably being able to take a broader view about what are all the barriers that people are facing. I think. Jeanette just synthesized this when, with her comments here about understanding how people are making decisions about, there's some uncertain hazard that's going to hit me, but also building on Sherman's comments. But I'm certain that if I go here, if I go to the, the, the I can't remember the name of the, the San Diego uh, football stadium, but that that is going to not be good for you, right? We were talking in, at the table about the Paducah tornado and how people um, who are in the candle factory how they didn't take shelter, but they were told that if they did take shelter, they would lose their job. So they're facing kind of this trade-off of an uncertain tornado hitting them versus an uncertainty, uh, uh, the cer certainty of losing their job. Or if people might you know, evacuate from a hurricane, they might lose their jobs or they might not have income. Uh, maybe they don't even lose their job, but they aren't, they're gonna lose some income. I think being able to understand what those barriers really are so that we can address them. We have some other work also in the tornado context where people are really aware about the, the tornado that's bearing down on them, but they would say, I have no safe place. I actually don't know where to go, right? And when they're having to make these decisions, I completely agree about preparedness is the best response and you need to help them think about that ahead of time. But also in the moment, if they don't know what direction the tornado is coming from, maybe it's at night, maybe they only have a couple of minutes. Rebecca talked about this beautifully earlier about you know, in many cases, people are making decisions on very, very short time scales. It would be ideal if they don't, but that is the reality. And so what are some of those barriers and can we figure out how to speak to all of those? I think we'll make things more inclusive. Mm -hmm. Yep. Brock. Uh, excuse me. I want to be mindful of uh, Sherman's, I think, excellent guidance uh, earlier in, in our session around the sort of mission creep around the word accessibility here. So I want to first uh, think about the disabled community and and you know uh, handicap community and the broader sort of spectrum of people who uh, might lack access to resources to capabilities that a lot of people take for granted. Um, I think that uh, the the way that you solve for accessibility is inclusiveness, as you mentioned here. Uh, I think that there's a degree of understanding that um, everyone is a permanent part of local communities and that, uh, as Sherman also mentioned, you can solve for this ahead of time by bringing those stakeholders to the table and in, including them in the sort of plans you have around sort of communication and methodologies of, of getting people to understand risk. <clears throat> um, at Hoss Alert, 
uh, we had an eye-opening experience in the early process of designing digital alerting, where we learned from the deaf and hard of hearing community just how valuable what we were doing was. And frankly, we took for granted the fact that there's a universe of drivers who never hear sirens. And giving them a conspicuous visual understanding that there's a hazard ahead of them and time for them to anticipate it uh, is, is such a life-saving tool for them in ways that that we didn't even factor in. And now they are permanently at the table with everything that we do moving forward because we never want to take that for granted. Um, and so, you know, one of the benefits of the time that we live in today, I think, is that um, we can see uh, these various groups, more they're more visible to us than ever. And, um, and we can be intentional about including them, I think. Sure, go ahead, Jim. And, I, and we get to a point where, you know, we, we check boxes and we think that's the solution. Um, even within a disability community, it's very diverse. I, I say all the time, you've got 61 million people in the U.S. with disabilities. That's 61 million ways of living with a disability. It's different for everybody. And what I learned, even as a person in a wheelchair, is, uh, you know, for example, for somebody who's deaf in a disaster at night, the importance of light, reading mouths, isn't you know forget about the flashing lights and everything's coming having a flashlight reading miles having first responders understand I've I'm talking to somebody and I have to have a light on my face because they read lips you know children with autism are attracted to water bodies of water that that's the, it's the highest rate of drowning the cause of drowning for children with autism because they see water is really abstract and don't sense the danger so having even a nuanced understanding within a community, somebody like me won't even have all the answers. So checking the box because I'm at the table is not going to do it. It's got to be so enculturated that you even start to see differences within a disability community to the point where disability wasn't a point. It's the differences in experiences. That was the whole point of having those different voices at the table. Gina or Rebecca? Gina? Yep. Sure. Thank you. I'm going to put my program manager hat on to, you know, how to we how do we make risk communication inclusive? Um, you prioritize it. Um, from, from a NOAA perspective, it goes back to the question that Castle posed in his talk. How do we know when we know enough from research to influence a change uh, or to recommend a change to our operational partners? And it's not good enough for us to, to just quote, trust the samples. We need to know who who were in those samples, right? Were all diverse audiences included? Did, did we check different vulnerabilities? Did we check different diversity, right? Um, and so from, from our perspective, it means having gaps analysis of our R&D. Um, where have we studied? What geographies, what people, what populations, uh, what unique abilities, right? And what haven't we studied, right? And make sure that we tried to put all of those types of audiences and make them a priority, right? Um, it's not good enough to just suggest it. We we can make sure that our research um, really includes them. And I'm I'm happy to say with our fiscal year 23, we really did focus on diversifying, and our academic community really answered uh, the charge. Uh, and we've really diversified our portfolio of projects, not necessarily all on tropical cyclones, but it is broadly on risk communication, deaf and hard of hearing, migrant populations, uh, pregnancy and heat, um, a variety of different unique situations. Um, and so I'm I'm proud to say with, you know, within the R&D portfolio we have, um, we are making it a priority. And I, I, I think that's one way to include is you, you include you, you, the act of actually doing it. And I think um, as a community, we've done a nice job, not to say that we don't have more to do, there are always more opportunities, but I, I think we're um, we're beginning to answer the charge. Yeah, I'll just chime in quickly to say, a uh, building on what um, the recent speakers have said, especially Gina and Sherman, um, really the importance of knowing who you're trying to include and doing the work of including them, including them in the conversation, um, and including the diversity of perspectives and then really listening to the complexity of their situation and not just kind of um, assuming it's just one thing and one solution will solve it or just a simple thing that's going to address a bunch of issues. Um, and then the thing, other piece is to keep on listening because things change, people change, our technologies change, our situations change. And so what might be the most valuable thing for a group now, there might be some nuances that um, are important to keep in mind that 
you know, come up later. Or once you address one big thing, then maybe the next things behind that can come, like putting the flashlight on your face. Well, after that, that's like the first level, but there are probably a lot of other things. And so to kind of keep listening and keep including people in the conversation. Sure. Yeah, Julie, go. Mm -hmm. um, this is more methodological, but I feel like it's important to say, I think everything um, that folks are saying is functionally saying this, but I want to be really explicit with it that this qualitative work with people in the communities is so essential. I stood up here yesterday and I talked about the longitudinal survey work that we've done, but that was all built on a lot of uh, preliminary qualitative research that we did. Jason showed some really powerful quotes yesterday from some of the qualitative work he did. Jeff, I think it was yesterday was talking about um, what functionally are people's mental models when he was talking about people who heard about the rain, the total amounts of rain over a few days from Hurricane Harvey and people said, oh, if it's like 35 inches over five or six or seven days, I'm going to divide that. How could we possibly know that that's what people are thinking unless they're, you're in the field? Of course, that was after the fact to understand that that's how people are processing information. If we don't know those things, if we don't know really richly and in the complex ways, Rebecca and Gina and others are talking about this, how people are processing kind of what some of those issues are that they're that they're facing we can't design some of the bigger, like N, larger number kind of uh, uh, quantitative work that we're doing to measure that. So I just really wanna put in a strong plug for all the important, rich, qualitative work that is done in this community too. Great, thank you. Uh, Marshall, I'll take one more and then I'll pass it off to you. Wanna get ready for another? Uh, part of this session, the half, second half is implications for the future. So what I'd like to do now is working with panel, we'll start with our virtual participants first is what what is that big takeaway from this week what what are you excited about moving ahead with where, where are we going from this workshop what are what is your big takeaway Rebecca do you want to start and then Gina sure I was hoping Gina would jump in that's a tough question I mean there's there's so many options but I think one big thing is um, I think we heard people talking about how the hurricane hazard, or other kinds of hazards kind of fit into the world that they are in, that they deal with every day. And then we heard from the people who are the meteorologists, how the other things, the technologies, social science, communication fit into their world. Um, and I think that um, kind of the biggest takeaway for me is the importance of bringing those perspectives together to have everyone in the same room is really important. And we've made a huge amount of progress in terms of each group knowing each other's perspectives, but to make sure that the work that each group is doing is contextually relevant to what everyone else is doing, I think is hugely important, as well as um, tacking back and forth between kind of the simplified context, like work where you show someone a message, see how they respond in a simplified context and learn from that, but then how do you bring that back up to the real world? And then how do you take the questions from the real world and, and ask uh, do research or understanding or, you know, build systems to address them in a more focused way. So that kind of tacking back and forth in the full complexity and the, the different perspectives or the simpler context. That was very general, broad, I guess, but I think that we're finally at that point where, where there's enough people in the room, you know, to be able to do that. Great. Thank you. Gina. Yeah, I had to go back to my my notes here. So I think I have two major takeaways and, and you know, looking into the future. Um, one is is bridging research and practice, practice to research. Um, again, I think there's so much value. I think sometimes we we study our partners, but we're not necessarily really working alongside them. And I think that's a challenge. Like I, I want to challenge myself. I want to work alongside an emergency manager. Uh, I don't want to get in the way, but I feel like I need to be in the field. I need to know what you're hearing, feeling, and seeing, right? Because I think it's really hard. I think that the research community is always trying to emulate. We, we hear a lot of the challenges from our partners, be it operational meteorologists or emergency managers, for example, and we take those challenges, we turn them into hypotheses, and we try to test them um, as best we can and, and replicate that, that real world environment. But it's hard. And so there, there's always some gaps between research and practice, practice and research, right? So I think we need to continue to bridge together, but also that knowledge transfer. If we have learned things from research, you know, if we're not, if they're not being utilized because of either trust in the research or believability or confidence, right? Well, then 
in my opinion, research that isn't used isn't particularly useful, right? And so it doesn't really have a lot of value. And so I want to make sure we're increasing the value. And I think one of the ways we do that is, is through these unique partnerships and, and working even more closely together. The second takeaway I have, um, as I heard a lot about everyone has a different perspective, um, you know, a county emergency manager, state, regional, what's happening at my home, um, we all want that type of personalized information. And so the major question and, and the innovation sort of for our whole field is how do we create an agile forecast to meet the needs of every user while still maintaining an official forecast? Because I think that's still something when we talk about consistency of message within tropical cyclones, we hear a lot about we still need that official forecast. Well, that official forecast undoubtedly is only going to work for a subset of people. It won't be agile. And so how do we do this? How do we have that official forecast and still have agility with our messages? And I, I am excited to see uh, this group of people 10 years from now, and hopefully we will have made a great progress toward this goal. Thank you. Uh, great. I'm going to continue to piggyback on the excellent uh, comments of uh, my co-panelists here, uh, particularly Gina, where the concept that uh, simple isn't easy. I think that uh, we are trying to get to a world where on an individual level, people have very simple, clear understanding of what they ought to do. And to Gina's point, um, that is going to vary dramatically on an individual basis, depending upon a person's location, uh, a person's family situation, a person's resources, um, and and then the scope of what's coming at them. Um, I'm also going to to harken back to Julie's earlier point from the technology side, from Hosler's side. I absolutely think that hyper personalization and localization is the entire future that we are going towards. Um, and just to sort of provide a practical example, right? If if Hosler begins to offer emergency response coordinators the opportunity for custom messaging to people in vehicles, right? Like that's level one of complexity where, okay, well now we can deliver specific messages to people in cars and like it might be get off the road or stay on the road or go that way or whatever it might be, right? But then the next layer of that is, okay, well, what about people in vehicles in this location versus people in that location? What about people that are already on the evacuation route or are headed away from the hazard or towards the hazard? And so any sort of second or third level iteration of that, it goes deeper and deeper towards this level of localization, personalization, a person identifying, okay, uh, give this to me in this language, <clears throat> give this to me at this level of repetition. Um, and so a, a corollary to that is, is that if we design those systems around hyper-personalization and localization to create feedback loops of data, then that also gives us a really, really powerful tool for understanding how we can continuously improve those systems to be optimized and to be effective um, and to continue to expand their accessibility, right? We can identify which groups are not getting these feedback loops, which groups are being excluded. Um, so I think that when you take that and inject it with all the other things that are happening around uh, AI and machine learning and um, all of these other tools, there's a really exciting frontier of what's possible here. Um, but ideally, we build it from the top down with best practices ar ar around around what should be a national approach to this, I think. You sure you don't want to jump in? Sure. Okay, you get the final word on this, which will be um, really powerful, I'm sure. Uh, I think in some ways, this builds a little bit on what Brock was just saying. Um, this might seem like a counterintuitive uh, sort of like take home, but I think we have some important prediction challenges in front of us. And I mentioned yesterday that I was going to take the risk calm frame and expand it a little bit more, but I think this is important because so much, I, I even wrote down this idea last night. I feel like so much of what we're talking about regarding risk communication assumes that we have knowledge and we have skillful predictions of the hazard and the impacts or really the risks that can be communicated, but I think there's a lot we still don't know. And two kind of components to this or threads, the way I think about it is sort of like meteorologically, the things we don't know. Alex talked yesterday about rain rates and I brought this up yesterday and I'll bring it up again. This is an important, like it's a challenging predictability and prediction problem, right? As is rapid intensification. 
I think Robbie mentioned yesterday, we're getting better with that, but there's still a lot we don't know. Otis was an example of that. Um, the co-occurring compounding hazards, like our ability to predict those things is still limited. So that's sort of like when we're thinking about this from like a hazard perspective, but I just wanna put a point on this. Those of you who have worked with me will know I'm gonna say this, predicting impacts. And I'm gonna, again, quote something Alex said yesterday, because I thought it was really powerful. And you were talking about the tails or the extremes, but it's hard to know how the meteorology will map to the impacts. And that's true, right? But this is really a risk communication challenge in general, when we're thinking about being able to predict the impacts, because we don't know, right? We, we understand kind of, we observe and we understand the processes that go on kind of in the atmosphere. But when that atmosphere intersects with the land surface or with social systems or with the built infrastructure any and all of those things, we don't hold that knowledge. I think it was, Jeff said this really nicely yesterday. He was referring to the winter storm when he was basically saying, we didn't know what the power impacts were going to be because we didn't understand how the power grid worked. So we didn't you know, put that kind of information out there. And I think he was framing that as what is the role of the meteorologist or where does, where does the meteorologist role stop? This is again, a systems, an earth systems, like what the atmosphere is doing and how it intersects with society and the built environment. And these are, these are predictability and prediction problems. And we don't really have data necessarily, although increasingly I think we do have data to be able to predict the impacts. And I think I agree um, with what Brock just said. I think this is an important potential role for AI to help us think about using new techniques to integrate these really disparate data sets in ways we haven't thought about doing. Um, but my takeaway is we have a lot of prediction challenges in front of us, I think, in order to be able to have something to communicate the risk about. And I guess I'll just offer a kind of a, a hasty observation. I haven't spent a lot of time with you, but in the short time, I think it's, it's important to remember that at the end of the day, um, we're still dealing with human beings, which all of us happen to be. And a lot of what happens in the lives of people in disasters, we can process some of that in our own experience. One of the things uh, we did uh, about three months ago is we tested the natural alert system with the FCC. And we had all these ideas about doing surveys afterwards and all this stuff. And I said, nope, I'm going to go, I'm going to go to a restaurant and I'm just going to sit there and I'm going to watch how this, this little sample I have reacts. Um, and I wasn't surprised by what I saw. I was a bit surprised though, that, um, that we're surprised that people don't really react or, or absorb messaging the way we expect them to. Um, I thought in that moment, it was important for me to take a more emic perspective because I'm one of them. I have to understand why they sort of, you know, cast off the danger or, or, um, and so I guess it's, it's, you know, we talked about a lot of prediction. What would you do in your life? What would your family unit, you know, we're not all that different when we're all under crisis. There's this sort of, you know, this, this impulse toward this homogenous will to survive or instinct to try to be safe. We all share. It's just, we all have different ways of realizing that like what's different is going to dictate what we decide, but we all want to live generally. And, and so people are the same in that way. And I think if you, you know, if I think Gina might have touched on a little bit, um, immerse yourself in experiences of people where there are problems, but by first understanding like your place in that dynamic and you as a human being, you're surrounded by the problem. You're surrounded by people. And I spent a lot of time talking to people. I was at my son's school um, at Langley the other day uh, doing a tornado display. We took a, you know, hot uh the the ice dry ice and added water and all that stuff but um but we were trying to take the mystery out of it but also wanted to see how people generally react to danger when they're not under crisis and what they think of it and how they process it so hearing a bunch of second third and fourth graders talk about it uh it it it, it gave me this idea um that if we talk to people in a in casual casual walk you'll find out You'll find out why people don't heed these disasters, uh, these threats and warnings. Uh, whether you can generalize is another question. You know, you've got your your ways of doing that, but um, but you all are people, and deep inside, hopefully, none of you face a disaster. But you'll it'll be real to you um, in, in your own walk. So don't underestimate the importance of having your own sort of emotion and your own experiences inform uh, some of these some of the uh, ways that we think about these questions. Thank, well, thank thank you. I think that really, as Brad uh, and others predicted, and I believe Julie, I think a very profound and useful way of thinking about the summary of that particular section of the panel. I, I'd, I'd like to sort of 
So bring my next line of questioning and feel free for any of you to tackle this, all of you or a subset of you. But after listening to a day and a half, two days of discussions, are there any glaring gaps or significant opportunities that you feel could emerge from the discussion? Gina, it looks like you're wanting to say something. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I'm I'm going back to my presentation, and we we did leave you know six major questions just sort of sitting there. So the the, the simple answer is yes, <laughs> there are gaps, um, but simple isn't easy. So it's the complexity of it. I, you know, I think on the one hand, I'm so in awe of what everyone can bring to the table here in the last two days, right? Um, the advancements of some of the technological developments, AI, um, the amazing social science research that's happening, right? Um, the predictability, the the how rapid the Hurricane Center is making product changes. You know, I think 10 years ago, we were probably at a slower pace, right? So much progress has been made. So on the one hand, I'm really in awe of what we've done. On the other hand, I, I think I will reiterate what is in our, uh, in the uh, presentation I made today. We really don't have a good way to evaluate the entire system. I think Julie was right to say this is this is a system. It's a system of systems, right? It's it's not just the forecast. It's not just impacts, but it's the intersection of the two. And I think while we have so many individual components happening at any one given time, it's incredibly hard to evaluate the success of any component of that system or how the system is working all together. Um, on the one hand, I'd say we're all doing pretty well, right? On the other hand, I think what we're hearing is that, you know, one size fits all messages don't work. We need to localize, we need to personalize. But as Julie so well noted, the predictability isn't always there to localize and personalize that information. I think that some of the tools that we have available to us right now are based on sort of an older way of thinking, right? It, it is based on the one size fits all. And so, you know, some of our gaps are literally building forecast systems that provide that agility, um, that pro provide that that um, a, a mix and match of forecast components with individual needs. What are all of those individual needs, right? I think we had a lot of those perspectives here in this room, but I certainly with not at 100% confidence level, could I say I know each unique need of the people that we're communicating to. And so I think, and, and, and even if we were to take a census of that today, I think we heard it'll be different tomorrow and a year from now and five years from now. So I think one of the biggest challenges is how do we keep up with that? You know, how do we keep localizing and personalizing and understanding all of these audiences within the limitations of resources, right? We, we all have limitations. And so I, I again, I'm, I'm in awe um, of the last two days, but I, I do think that there are gaps um, and, and, and ways to approach this. I, I think, I think Julie said it, I think I'm, I, AI has a lot of promise here. AI is a tool. Um, I always think of things as a tool, not a solution, right? Um, and so once again, sort of how do we all work together in some kind of continuous fashion in, in, in a knowledge transfer? How, how do we continue to have this over the next two days, but almost do it more often? <laughs> and that's a hard thing to to answer. Yeah, I'll and, and, oh, feel free to jump in. But I did want to say, and I think I'm capturing a, a note that Brad just shared with me. I, I think in some of these questions about key takeaways, surprises and opportunities, we after we hear from the panel, I think we're certainly open to any thoughts from those of you in the room and virtually as well. So go go, go right ahead. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, once again, going to to quote Sherman here. Um, I don't know if I would define this as as a gap in our discussion here, but I think it's something that we take for granted, which is the the human element at the local leadership level. Um, and the best example I can give as a as a resident of Florida is um, it is fascinating to hear so many experts in this room, like the level of rigor and thought and effort that goes into building these systems and products that give us with granularity, the ability to say, you know, there's a X percent chance of, of Y risk happening in Z area. And then 
a county supervisor can decide, I'm not going to tell my people to evacuate. <laughs> and then and then at the last minute, they can say, oops, we should have told them to evacuate, even though we received this guidance, even though we had all this probability, you know, it's like three dudes with an opinion. And so I don't know what the answer is to that, because I don't think that I think that that is just a built in like it's an, an inherent component of our system. Um, but I do think that it it sort of gives us the opportunity to think more holistically about when we are designing tool sets and products that are available to the public, especially if they are enhanced with hyper-personalization and localization, that then oftentimes you might actually be filling the gap that is created by a local supervisor or a local county of, official or something that just doesn't think it's a problem. Um, so I think that it's just... Uh, frankly, just a permanent a permanent fixture of 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 addressing these challenges. Actually, I'll offer this thought, and then if um, well, if others don't have anything to say, maybe this will open things up to folks online. This is um, I don't believe Daphne touched on this yesterday. Forgive me if she did, but one thing I don't think we've touched on here is a gap is critical incident stress of the providers of the information, of the forecasters, of the emergency managers, of the broadcasters. And I think, um, you know, some folks in our community, Jen Henderson has touched on this a little bit. I think Kim Cloco has a little bit. But for those of us who have shadowed some of the providers of information, whether forecasters or gone in after some of these big events and done interviews with them, the stress that they experience, I mean, you know, whether or not we we start talking about moral injury, I think because they have only so much capacity to be able to protect the lives and livelihoods of the people who they are there to serve is a risk. Um, and it is, in many cases, kind of a broader frame to how we're thinking about risk and risk communication. I keep saying I'm broadening the frame more and more, um, but I just wanted to offer this. I think it is a gap of something that we've missed in this conversation. Yes, yeah, so offer kind of a, I guess, a type of gap, and it's the the assumption that we have to look at all of these through a deficit view. Um, what didn't work? Uh, there's a lot of what you're doing that's working, and I think we should be just as focused on what has worked. I can tell you, before Hurricane Fiona, there were an awful lot of people on ketamine dialysis who prepared three days before that Fiona hit. Um, because they knew what to do and they had enough information to act. And a lot of the medical professionals in Puerto Rico were instrumental in having them prepare for extensive blackouts and people lived longer. Assume that what you're doing is working to an extent. We want hundred percent, you know, and, and, and zero defect, but it's not possible. People have too much autonomy. Uh, but I hope that one gap that we, um, that we sort of uh, don't, don't underestimate is how successful your work is in helping people who have to make decisions in a split second, people in those tornadoes who instinctively go to the middle of their home or get in a bathtub. And when you ask them, oh, this is what I heard. I don't know why I heard it, but this is what I heard. Or I saw something. Those college kids at the, at the university in Tennessee, um, you, you're reaching people. So I hope you take that away from this. And, and it's not really a gap, but, I, but it should be uh, said here that uh, thank you, because what you're doing is saving lives. Um, as far as the opportunities for risk communication, I think people have excellent ideas about the gaps and, and things moving forward. I think that what I'm really excited to see is each of us who are in this room go back and take what we've learned and bring it into our everyday work and then come back again together, of course, with you know some changes with different people and see what we've learned. But I think the power of that, of each of us taking what we do best and our strengths and bringing in what we've learned into that is is really amazing. I also think as far as risk communication itself on the near term, I think um, seeing the information providers, the communicators bring in some of what um, has been talked about today into how they communicate, especially NOAA will be amazing. I mean, I think as someone who's been watching this for a long time, I feel like NOAA, the Weather Service, Hurricane Center, Office of Atmospheric Research, everyone is teed up to now take in all of what is being learned and really um, change how they communicate um, to improve the communication as well as um, kind of leverage their strength and their, their strengths and their kind of role as the official forecast along with agility. So I think 
in today's world, NOAA and the Weather Service still set the stage for how hurricane risk is communicated. And we've done research on that and others have it. It matters a lot, even if you can't always see it every place. And so the opportunity for really the groups that are setting the stage for the communication to raise the bar and take in this knowledge and improve how they communicate can really help everyone. Okay, thank you. I think I'm going to jump in with a comment really quick. In Brad, before you make a comment, I just want, could I jump in? Okay. I, I just need to leave. I just wanted to just share that uh, I, I actually thought the session was ending at 4.15. My son's got a basketball game. I got to get him to, but you're in good hands with Brad. So thank you all. Thank you, Marshall. Appreciate it. Julie, your comments about dealing with uncertainty and, and especially with increasing projection time brought back big memories of my own when we were doing the gridded forecast in the weather service, the NDFD, National Digital Forecast Database. And we wanted to, this was 25 years ago or something. And we wanted, you know, I think it was five, but then we went to two and a half kilometer pixelization. And well, how can we go out seven days at two and a half kilometers pixelization? And it was a struggle because we can't forecast at two and a half kilometers at seven days. We can't do that tomorrow, right? I mean, so how do you rationalize getting, but what was driving it was sort of the, the topography, the, the geoclimatic signals, knowing where the lakes are and, and the forecasters, and especially now with AI, there's a lot of detail that isn't time dependent. That's more, you know, you know, highs and lows, right? You know, it's going to be a diurnal. So we started pulling in, so you have these things that there, that there isn't a lot of increase in uncertainty with over time. And then you with the, the messy stuff later. So when I sort of step back and look at what we've talked about, th there's a messy uncertainty issue with weather information. But there is a lot that we know about localization and personalization about the built in, you know, the built structure. I mean, the infrastructure. We, we know about DEMs. They don't change. Uh, we know if you move a little bit more into the physical environment, we certainly know tidal cycles. So even it's day seven or whatever, if you're risking some kind of flood, even the fact that communicating that your most likely period of flooding that day is at your high tide and tell them the high tide. I mean, there are things that you can pull out. So I'm not saying it's easy. Thank you, Gina. Uh, but there's stuff that you can keep, that you can keep personalized and localized all the way out through that projection period. And then, so don't let the uncertainty piece be the driver of the personalization necessarily. I, th I think that there is a separate discussion around both. Um, so maybe we do open up to questions from the floor or I don't know, Hugh, do we have some Slido questions or? Uh, so there's not a ton in the Slido right now, but I'd love to take some from the room. I think I'm the only local emergency manager in the room and online right now, but I, I, I just I got to offer a perspective. And it comes down to that, the comments about decision-making when it comes to evacuations and things that take place in our communities, not just when a hurricane's coming our way, but it could happen in a moment when a fire chief's standing on the corner and he or she has to make a decision to do something to save lives. I, I, I would encourage you all to, to consider looking into that element of decision-making at the local level to, to provide you a little bit better understanding of how quick it needs to be done, but how deliberately it is done when you need to do it. Uh, in, in my community, uh, we um, you can go on our website, we have a emergency decision-making video. It's about five minutes long. Uh, we we had to develop it because our community came under fire when we made decisions during COVID uh, to close our community and not let people into it. Uh, we we had a lot of questions as to who's doing that, why is it getting done. Uh, we laid out the authorities that we have, where they come from, why we have to use it, the measures we can and can't use, and to the point of yes, there's an elected official who has the authority to put his signature on the paper that makes that order. He's not doing, he or she's not doing it without the sage advice of everybody an emergency manager can bring into the room to give that person the best information possible at the right time. 
and in decision making when it comes to evacuation orders and you have a little bit of lead time, it's easy. But if you're that police chief, that fire chief, that EMS chief standing on a corner, you, you got it around you and you're relying on it. So I would just encourage you to research that a little bit and think about that because there's a lot of demystification that could take place if you talk to the local emergency managers about processes and things that need to get done. Uh, thank you for allowing me to share that comment with you. Um, it wasn't a question, comment, just a thought. Actually, you, I'd, I'd love to, sure. to add on to this. Yeah. One of the things that has shocked me the most at Hoslerd and working with first responders is how under-resourced uh, first responders are at a local level. Um, you know, one of the things that we do is we lobby as part of Hill Day uh, with the Congressional Fire Services Institute around AFG grants. And I don't know whether or not, I'm sure actually most of this room probably knows this, but the the, the funding, the public funding that local and volunteer firefighters draw from, and especially, you know, AFG grants in particular is a federal source for resources just to get protective safety equipment has declined over the last 10 years. And it hasn't been re-upped. It hasn't been reauthorized at higher levels. And so we are expecting our local responders to do more and more and take on more and more of this risk with less resources than they've had available to them at any point in the last 20 years. And so um, the, your point's well taken. And uh, to beyond that, you know, to have the weight of those decisions when you've got very limited resources and you're trying to figure out how can you best deliver safety for everyone in your, in your community, is in many ways an impossible task. So I, I absolutely agree. And they don't necessarily need to be questions. They can also be lessons learned and takeaways and like, yes, please in the back. Hi, I'm Bob Hershey. I'm a consultant. Uh, has there been any approach to putting a mathematical expectation on these events? of the dollar value, which has often been come up with for uh, past uh, events of the property damage plus injuries plus deaths and putting a dollar amount on it and then multiplying that by the probability. Has there been any attempt to do this and present it to the public? In real time, are you talking about doing this or, uh, or, or just ahead of time? Ahead of time. Obviously, it will fluctuate as the storm gets closer, that you'll get a better probability of it. Or you might find uh, what the path of damage is likely to be, which would increase or decrease the dollar amount. But having uh, a mathematical expectation, I think, will make things clearer to the public and to everybody involved. I, I was, the danger in that is, you know, if you've got a 95% a probability of bad, that 5% is what people may hope, you know, hang on to. I, I don't know. I know that there are calculations made, flood areas, things like that. Um, I, I'd have to think about that because there are people that are going to, so you're saying there's a 5% chance. Is that, is that, you know, so, um, but that'd be interesting if if we could do that. It'd be a five percent chance, or a one percent chance, yeah. or a tenth of a percent, or a fifty percent. Every event's going to be different. Yeah, but having that in advance, I don't know. People might make decisions. Uh, well, the and... further in advance it is, uh, obviously, the bigger the spread of the probabilities. Yeah, mm -hmm. that uncertainty piece and. Thank you all. There's no way I'm going to be able to summarize what you guys have said in my next <laughs> few words. Um, so I have a question for all of you. Um, there's been a lot of discussion here about partnerships and the importance of working together. Um, and I'm just thinking about, uh, I mean, I know they're in Washington state, they've been consolidating like fire departments across communities because there's such so low resource. And you know, that means they can't respond as quickly. And so there are all kinds of issues like that going on. I also know that in within agencies, like when I I worked at NSF for a little while, and partnering with other agencies was a problem because they expected you to add it to your current job without any extra pay or time or anything. Um, so how thinking about all the discussions of partnerships here, how do you feel you, that there is adequate resource to partner with all these partners, and how do you partner with under resourced local um, responders given that they are already taxed? 
do you have strategies for thinking about how to do this constructively? Well, part of our job is is to you know assess what you know what what the local needs are. A lot of it is the state and the uh, federal government or the municipality or the tribal working in hand with the federal government to ascertain what it is. And depending on the the, the level of loss and profound nature of the of the of the damage, um, you know, there could be significant resources. That's one thing that is there. The resources are there. The problem is, you get what you get when you show up. And if that community wasn't prepared. Um, and that's not a knock on any local community. A lot of them are are dealing with, you know, tough things, but you got human made disasters, you know, even um, a lot of it is reacting to what you have and then trying to figure out what, what you have and you can't plan for everything. So, um, you know, every disaster is different. There's, there's no one way to look at them. So it's, it's really going to be understand as quickly as you can, you know, what the threat level is, what you can mitigate. And at the same time, how do you stop the damage from getting worse? How do you stop things? A lot of the, you know, heat heat is a problem after a hurricane, and it kills a lot of people after. So, I won't say a lot of people in some areas that that becomes the other uh, the other threat. So, um, I would say the resources are there from a FEMA perspective. A lot of it is just what do we have when we show up? What's there? What was already there? How much of the state wants to own it? Tennessee, you know, they. Mississippi, they were great. They really run their disasters. And there are some places that are a little more, you know, come on in and help us out. Um, so it's different every time, but I, I don't think it's a resource problem, at least from the federal government side. Uh, I've, I've been probably spoiled a little bit at Hosler because we have, we literally build a partnership model into every operation we have. We don't believe that there's anything we can do uh, in isolation. And so working with the ecosystem is a permanent part of our scope and it's a permanent part of our approach. I'll say that I've been shocked at how much ingenuity it is required of us to accomplish our goals by literally creating new legislative vehicles for funding. I mean, we lobbied and got $15 million in the bipartisan infrastructure law to equip local fleets with digital alerting. Um, because we identified that there was such a small pool of funds available to local responders for basic protective equipment, and those grant programs are competitive. And so we didn't want to inject more competition into an already limited resource pool. And we had to, you know, partner with our customers to go to the federal government and demonstrate need. Um, I'll say, though, that uh, from the private sector perspective, you know, the whole point of innovation is to is to create new opportunities. And it's always uh, amazing to me what you can accomplish when you go into a circumstance and you take for just an assumption like, you know, this local community is doing everything they can to meet their needs. What are things that we can bring to bear to help accomplish these objectives? Um, and I get the sense that most of the people in this particular universe uh, partnership is just a standard part of what of what you do, right? Everything that you, nothing you do is in a vacuum. Um, so I, I do think though that we are going through a process right now as a country of um, in many ways sort of training ourselves from a, from a policy perspective to move as quickly as the market can move. Uh, and that is a, a difficult thing to accomplish, but I'd like to say that it seems like we're getting better, uh, but it, it takes constant work for sure. I'll jump in to and and answer this from a, a you know a NOAA perspective from an R and D perspective. Um, I think one of the good things that came out of the pandemic was an increase in virtual tools, and so that has enabled more participation from people that perhaps couldn't travel, but now there's more inclusivity, right? They they have. Um, more options to participate. You don't need to travel. You you know you just need a laptop, and and hopefully, uh, you know there's access there. Where where there's not, well, then we've got to work on that, right? Um, but I think that has opened up a lot, an increase. We have not seen, um, in the last five years of our program, we have not seen a decrease in emergency management participation in research. I'd say we've seen an uptick in that participation. Um, I also think. Uh, there have been a lot of opportunities to provide feedback. Um, I, I agree with that. I'm sorry I didn't recall your name, but the local emergency manager who's in the room, um, thank you for those earlier comments and I take them to heart. Um, it's one thing, you know, a, a lot of our researchers meet with emergency managers after the fact. And 
this is what I mean by sometimes it would be really nice. We'll sign an NDA to sit during an event and literally watch what you do. And the reason why I say that is not because we're trying to make you a subject of research, not because of that, but because being there live real time is very different than hearing about an event after the fact and, and having increased empathy for the pressures on you and the demands on you. That's hard to understand in an interview afterwards as compared to actually witnessing it during an event. That That is a perspective I do not have, right? But I'd like to have, I want to make sure I have that understanding and empathy for the hard work that you do. Um, but we, in addition to that, uh, so again, participation, Grants can include, uh, and I, I say this uh, publicly for those who applied, if you want to put in travel for emergency managers as a subset, you may. Um, if something were to require um, in-person travel, or of course the academics can travel to the emergency managers. I think what our program has found is that if we want to do knowledge transfer events, we have to go to them. We should not expect them to travel to a conference that is not one of their normal conferences. There's not a lot of travel money out there. Um, we need to go local to them. And so, you know, to the extent that we have resources to do that, we will try. But again, I would say one of the nice things about the pandemic is, is utilizing those virtual resources for more open communication. Okay. Thank you, Gina. And we're going to move on. So I want to everyone join me in thanking our brilliant roundtable members. And now I'm going to turn it over to Anne for a wrap up. Well, I will try to keep this short because I cer certainly can't top anything that everybody has said here. Um, it's been a really fantastic two days. I hope you all agree with me that it's been an extre extremely rich conversation that hopefully the community will draw on for years to come, and and we will take a, we'll take a strong recognition and and benefit from all the things that have been said here today. Uh, I'd like to piggyback on a couple of comments that were made in this last section and earlier. Sherman reminded us that this broader tropical cyclone risk communication community has achieved a lot of successes. So I'd like to emphasize that again, we heard a lot about advances and successes here that for me personally were exciting. And I think for all of us were enlightening and the various things that we have learned about. Preparedness is the best and first response and partnerships and strong relationships and, commun and communications efforts and in research efforts can facilitate cultural competence, hyper-localization and personalization of preparedness. So really big opportunities here that we see arising from many of the things that we heard about here today. The topic of the workshop is advancing risk communication with decision makers for tropical cyclones and learning from unprecedented and extreme weather events. And that, as Julie reminded us, requires an earth system science approach across all the sciences. This challenges all of us to figure out how to evaluate the success of the system and its components, as Gina reminded us. So, so that we can design systems with dynamic population representative and inclusive feedback loops. We heard um, also in this last panel, panel to understand how well the system is working using a national approach, but that is a challenge that we have yet to conquer. So something to focus on. And finally, meteorological, social, computational, and other sciences working together with partners on the ground and in exposed communities can help each other advance. So there are lots of opportunities here to, to build on what we've done. I'd like to thank you all for a really amazing workshop, especially the committee that has worked so hard to put this together. Um, and there, we have uh, identified a few gaps and lots of opportunities and successes to date. I've heard a lot of conversations between people who haven't met before. I'm really pleased about the relationships that I see developing here. And I'd like to thank the Board on Atmospheric Sciences and Clim uh, Climate for generating the idea for this workshop and the sponsors, NASA, NOAA, and the, um, or should I spell all that out? <laughs> and, the, and the National Science Foundation. And um, the planning committee, as I said, has been um, really diligent, has met more times than you would care to think, and, and um, has been really heroic in committing to all of the work that it, um, that it took to put this together. The recording is going to be shared online. Thank you, National Academies. And feel free to share that with anyone who couldn't participate, who missed some key part that you thought they should have listened to. And the proceedings document will be produced 
we were told not as soon as we would like, but pretty soon. <laughs> so so uh, later in the spring or in the early summer of this year to summarize the event. Thank you all. You've been a really excellent group of participants. I don't think anybody in this room has been quiet the entire time. And it's been, uh, it's made the workshop an incredibly rich experience. The meeting is adjourned.